Hello everybody, this is the first in a series of screencasts in which I will show features of Quantlib and uh, in order to do it in an interactive way I won't be showing C++ code directly instead I will uh, use the Python bindings and I will run code from an IPython notebook don't worry though, it's easy enough to translate the Python code into the corresponding C++ code class names are the same, method names are the same, the only, the only relevant difference is that uh, most C++ objects are stored and passed around in shared pointers which are hidden in Python instead because they're not uh, idiomatic however you, you can see easily enough where uh, the shared pointers are needed you just have to look at the declaration of the methods in C++ and uh, you'll see all the places where you have to insert them, so I won't expect you to have any any problems to to do that. Okay, let's get started. In this screencast, I will look at instruments and pressing engines. Okay, this is just some kind of setup. Uh, import the quantity module. I will fix the evaluation date to, well, this is just the, the, the date that happened to be today's date when I first started working on this notebook. And so I'll fix it as the evaluation date now. As an instrument, I will uh, use the classic textbook example, a European option. Building it just requires the specification of the contract. So what we'll have is what we need is the payoff, it's a call option, the strike is at 100 and it's a European exercise which is three months from today's date once I build the option, okay once I build the option we're going to need the pressing engine so the first we'll use is the one encapsulating the, the formula for the analytic Black-Scholes model we're going to use, well, flat risk rate and volatility, so those can be expressed by simple quotes. Those are numbers that can be observed and can notify observers when their value changes. So we start with the underlying at 100, risk rate at 1%, and volatility at 20%. Now, these market data in order to, to, to build the engine, will be encapsulated in a black shows process object. So first, we'll build flat curves for the risk rate and the volatility. And then we'll build the actual process passing the, 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 the underline and the curves that we just built. They are stored inside handles so that uh, we might be able to, to, to change the the curve later, but I'll just skip over the, this feature for now. Once we have the process, we can build the engine. And once we have the engine, we can set it to the option. And at this point, the option can be evaluated. So first we set it. At this point, we can ask the option for its value, which it calculates. We can ask for other, well, depending on the instrument, For we can ask for other results. In this case, we can ask for bricks. Now, as I said, market data are stored in quotes and can notify observers, such as the engine and the instrument in turn, when they change. So, when any data change, we don't need to do anything to tell the option to, that, that uh, this happened. So if right now we have this value for the option, the same that we have just seen, once we set a new value for the underlying, we don't have to, to, to call any particular methods in the option, we just ask for the MPV again, and we're going to get the updated value now, just for fun, I will use this to 
create a graph of the option value depending on the underlying. I'll just, well, this is just a bit of notebook magic that I will uh, gloss over. And then I'll just make the underlying asset value go from 80 to 120. I'll just set, I'll just take a, a number of points in between. I'll set the, the value of the underlying to each of those in turn and we'll collect the MPVs on the values. And here goes nothing. Okay, here is the graph. So, as we saw, changing the inputs, we change the value of the option. That's not the only thing that can happen. We can also change the evolution date. So, for instance, let's set the value of the option at 105 and print its MPV. Okay, now, as uh, you might remember, we uh, today's date is March 7th and the option will expire in three months time. We can change the evaluation date. Now the option expires in two months time and uh, again, we don't have to do anything particular, we just ask the option for its MPV and here we go. So we lost some some value. We can display the value as we did before. Okay, now the new line is the the green one is the the new value of the option. We can get closer and closer to the evaluation date and plot the value again. So the value keeps decreasing, keeps decreasing. Okay, I'm not going to show all of this. I'll just show how we can go just one day before the exercise date. And at this point, we'll get almost the intrinsic payoff. So it's zero, almost until to, 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 to strike and then it goes up. Unfortunately, I can't show you the, the intrinsic payoff exactly because, uh, well, in the default configuration, if we set this date to the exercise date, as I'm doing here, then conflict thinks that the option has expired and returns a null MPV. Okay, I've shown the um, how the option changes when the evolution date changes, when the underlying changes. Of course, also the other market data affect the value. So if I set back the evolution date today and print the MPV, I still get the, this value. I can set the risk-free rate to 3% instead of 1%. And again, the value changes. I can set the volatility to 25% and the value changes again. Now, the pricing engine mechanism allows us to use different pricing methods, which means, okay, let's get back to the initial values and once again print the MPV of the option. Let's say I want to change the evolution methods. For instance, I want to use a Heston model. What I have to do is to create, well, of course, the model, the parameters, whatever, and then a new engine that encapsulates the Heston pricing formula and set the new engine to the option. Again, I can just ask the option for its MPV and here is the new value. One last thing I want to show today. Up to now, we didn't really need the, the observer pattern and the notification mechanism. I mean, in order for the, for the option to recalculate each time that, that uh, anything changes, we might just recalculate each time that uh, we ask for the MPV and uh, well, automatically the, the option will perform a calculation based on the current values 
of the the curves and the market data and whatever and and the engine which is set and whatever else is needed. However, there is another side of the, of the notification mechanism, which is that not only the option is recalculated when anything, anything changes, but also the option is not recalculated if nothing changed. For instance, let's set the engine to a Monte Carlo one and one which takes a uh, some some time to calculate just a few seconds so now i will ask for the for the mpv here we go okay as you see the notebook stays busy for a few seconds calculating and only after okay only after a few seconds we get the an mpv for the option however if we don't change any market data and we ask the option for the mpv again here we go. Oop. The response in this case is instantaneous, meaning that we didn't actually recalculate. We just the option just stored the previous result and returned it without recalculating when we asked for the MPV again. When anything changes, like for instance, let's set the value of the underline to 104. Now the option was notified that one of the inputs changed. So if we ask for the MPV again, here we go. The option recalculates the whole thing. So it's a few seconds again before we get the MPV. Here it is. Again, if we ask for the MPV again with the same inputs, we get an instantaneous response. Here it is. OK. so. This is all for the screencast. I'll, uh, well, I'll see you all next time, I hope. Bye.